Hello to everyone. Welcome to the third edition of the Mini Battle E Series. My name is Manos Delakis from Hygiea Hospital of Athens, Greece, and this is the episode 14. Since we count down to the February of 2022, when we hope to organize live the next Athens Older Court. Until then, we came up with the idea of launching the monthly webinars dedicated to shoulder pathology and treatment in order to promote the contact between us, as well as the need for continuing education. So this is the mini battle E-series. And in this episode, we will discuss about SCR as a, tri a treatment option for irreparable rotator cuff tears. So let me welcome you uh, also to this uh, mini battle. I am Manos Antonianakis. I am the chairman of uh, Athens Shoulder Course. Since we had uh, to postpone the uh, Athens Shoulder Course for 21 due to the situation, the COVID situation, we decided to start these uh, meetings every month and um, uh, discuss uh, important and um, also interesting shoulder uh, problems. And uh, before we start, first uh, the poll, the question for you, for the participants is, uh, which is your preferred graft choice for SCR? And uh, the option is uh, fascia lata, the human dermal, the human, the dermal allograft or other. Please take, take your time in order to uh, submit your answer. So, um, this episode is dedicated to superior capsule reconstruction and uh, we have two excellent surgeons that they are going to discuss and present their opinions about uh, this treatment of irreparable rotator cuff tears. And although it is a mini battle in reality, uh, we are going to discuss about the upper and lower limits of ACR when to define a, a rotator cuff as a parable and go to a SCR as a solution, where to abandon SCR and go to a reverse uh, shoulder arthroplasty as a solution to the problem of the patient. We have today two excellent uh, surgeons and two beautiful ladies also, Dr. Uh, Clara Zevento from Portugal from uh, the hospital um, from Central Hospital Traumatology, Orthopedic Traumatology Central Hospital de Lisbon. And also Anna Caterina Angelo from the same hospital. So, Manos. Throughout the mini battle, you can also submit your question and check if this question has already been submitted by another college. If you click on this, on the triangle on the left, uh, you express your interest to, to promote this question. And Dr. Agnes, please, without okay, further... So, so let's start this uh, mini battle. And uh, we're going to start with uh, Dr. Clara Zervento. Uh, Clara, please. Hi. So good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to share with you our views on spirit capsule reconstruction. I'd like to thank Manos and Manos for this kind invitation. And I'll, I'll try to uh, explain what can be considered the lower bound for choosing an SCR. So to start, I'd like to make it clearer uh, why are we even discussing SCR? It's because we're facing um, a challenge to treat posterior superior uh, irreparable rotator cuff tears. There, there are nowadays multiple uh, treatment modalities to offer to these patients. And what we want is to offer the treatment choice that can produce the, larger, the largest uh, increases 
in uh, clinical outcomes in these patients. And we don't have a procedure that is exempt of complications or limitations. All procedures have uh, advantages and disadvantages. And uh, I, I'd like to show you, the, for instance, this systematic review, uh, which has its own limitations because it compares 11 treatment modalities available for posterior superior rotator cuff tears uh, at the minimum follow-up of two years. It compared 2,000 uh, patients in 60 studies. Um, and this, uh, despite having some limitation, it showed that FCR using a fascial autograph because the studies with more than two years follow-up uh, used fascial at this time in 2019. Uh, this was the treatment modality amongst these 11 procedures and choices that produces the largest increases in the mean constant score and also in the AZ score in irreparable rotator cuff tears without uh, uh, glenohumeral osteoarthritis. Um, this is why we're discussing SCR. But we should learn from the mistakes of the past. And this procedure, when it started, it started as an open technique described by Anada and his co-workers uh, who sutured the fascial autographs to the superior labrum proximally and to the long head of the biceps distally. And this didn't work. Uh, the, the results were unsatisfactory. Patients did not regain active painless elevation. What impressed uh, surgeons worldwide were the results published by Professor Teresa Mihata and his co-workers in 2013. Uh, uh, Mihata and his co-workers used an arthroscopic uh, superior capsule reconstruction technique and harvested the fascial autograph through an open approach. But this time, they anchored the fascial autograph to the superior clanoid rim and to the original footprint of the supraspinatus with a transosseous equivalent uh, configuration. This produced groundbreaking results at the minimum follow-up of two years in 24 shoulders with only a 5% graft tear rate. And uh, uh, in patients with pseudo paralysis uh, saw their active painless elevation restored with this procedure. Uh, more recently, Professor Mihata and his coworkers published their results at a minimum follow-up of five years, also with good results and with a slight increase in graft tears of 10%. More recently, even, Professor Teresa Mihata turned his attention to trying to uh, lower the threshold for uh, superior capsule reconstruction for patients who have criteria of irreparability, although the supraspinatus is still able to be reduced to its original footprint. The, the idea was to try to reduce the tear rate of rotator cuff repairs in patients with uh, m many criteria of irreparability preoperatively pre through the MRI, for instance. Uh, all, uh, although these, these results are, are very good, uh, the follow-up is short. It's only one year follow-up. Uh, but the, these patients did not have any rotator cuff tear repairs, and in this technique, the, the superior capsule reconstruction is performed and the supraspinatus is repaired over the top of the fascial auto autograph. Uh, and and this, in this technique, Mihata and his co-workers suture the supraspinatus also to the superior glenoid uh, rim anchor and to the transosseous equivalent. Other authors fo followed this idea also uh, of performing an arthroscopic SCR and a rotator cuff tear repair, but we don't have a clinical results for these techniques. They're, they're the, the only uh, techniques available are surgical techniques with no clinical outcomes shared uh, to date. And also there are uh, differences in techniques. Most of the authors don't agree with uh, suturing the, the, the supraspinatus uh, proximally to the superior glenoid rim because they consider that the, the superior supraspinatus rule is tethered by this uh, uh, technique. So why are we trying to expand this technique uh, and to lower the threshold? It's because uh, in irreparable rotator cuff tears, patients lose the fulcrum to the deltoid pulling vector. And this, this is why they, they cannot perform active anterior elevation. Uh, 
uh, and when we perform the FCR, we restore the static plenary removal stability. The patients regain the fulcrum and the, the balance force couple of the subscapularis and the infraspinatus and the teres minor can now work to restore the active elevation of these patients. And further, uh, it is thought that if we can incorporate the superior capsule, the superior cuff remnants to this construct, we may improve the biologic environment for both the rotator cuff and the graft healing because we'll bring new, uh, vascularization from the rotator cuff remnant to the, to the graft that will improve its healing and the remnants will also benefit from the stabilization of the, the glenohumeral joint to, to heal uh, better. This is the idea behind this. But as you can see by all this talk, there is a high controversy regarding the, the choice of SCR for which patients should we use this technique. And this is based on the problem of that we don't agree, we don't have a consensus on what is a massive rotator cuff tear. Is it a rotator cuff tear that involves two or more tendons? Is, is it a rotator cuff tear that is uh, larger than five centimeters? Or is it because it's biologically irreparable and it has preoperative criteria of irreparability, like severe atrophy of the supraspinatus or severe fatty degeneration of the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus that, that condemned it, condemned it to, to not healing? Uh, because we see that while it's possible to reduce almost everything to its original footprint, what can be reduced may not be biologically repairable and may not heal. That is the big question. But it's very difficult to analyze the literature because we have so much heterogeneity and we have so many different types of graphs nowadays with clinical outcomes. Uh, human dermal allograph, long head of the biceps autograph, other fascial graft constructs with different configurations of the fixations, using the hamstring, using the porcine dermal xenograph, Teflon felt, interposing synthetic mesh like proline with the fascial autograph. All these techniques of arthroscopic SCR produce good clinical outcomes in irreparable rotator cuff tears as long as there's a preserved glenohumeral cartilage. But all these studies have a low level of evidence they're all only case series, and then you have case reports and technical notes and biomechanical studies. We conducted a, a systematic review last year, up to February last year, and we compared uh, studies using fascial autograft and human dermal allograft and published them in our arthroscopy journal. And all studies reported their criteria of irreparability uh, uh, as an intraoperative decision where Irreparability was confirmed through the inability to repair the torn tendons to their original footprint without undue tension. And this is subjective. And while all authors also use preoperative criteria such as MRI fatty degeneration and supraspinatus atrophy, uh, it is very difficult to compare these studies because the atrogenity starts from the the decision of the procedure, the indication, and 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 then continues with the type of graft which is different. Uh, and uh, the, the position and the thickness of the graft, the position of the patient. We perform our, our, our technique uh, using the beach chair position. Other authors like Nehata in lateral decubitus, this will influence graft tension. Also the position of the arm, 30 to 45 degrees abduction, Nehata's studies. In ours, it's 10 degrees. Iroharas, uh, you, you have your shoulder in a neutral position resting at the side, and the, the portals are different. Uh, the type of anchors, the configuration of the fixation, you have a higher tear rate with single row fixation uh, uh, of the, the construct laterally. Uh, and then also, this is not an isolated procedure. You have anchors for the subscapularis. You, you have torn subscapularis tendons and more tendons torn. You have subscapular tendons which are repaired and sometimes it's irreparable. And you have studies where you repair the rotator cuff also and uh, patients where you do a, t a tenotomy, others you don't have a long head of the biceps. So what are we comparing? And uh, just this month, Professor Teresa Mihatu published another study and compared the results among SCR in patients who had a subscapularis tendon intact or repairable with patients who had 
the subscapular tendon, which was irreparable. And they found that the, the, the best results at a mean follow-up of three years, mi minimum follow-up of two, maximum follow-up of 11 years, was the, the patients with an intact or reparable subscapular tendon had be the better results with a, a lower graft tear rate uh, compared to the patients who had a subscapular tendon which was irreparable. However, all patients had pain relief with this, the FCR. So uh, Mihata advises that if you have an irreparable uh, subscapularis, you should perform an additional procedure to, to the FCR, such as the tenon transfer, to compensate for the irreparability of the subscapularis. And the outcomes are very bad if you only do an FCR when you have an irreparable subscapularis tenon tenon. And what about our results? We also have very good results for posterior superior uh, irreparable aesthetic of tears with a high patient satisfaction. And we have an increased tear rate with time from six months to three years, nine to 21% of a, an increase in the tear rate of the, of the fascial art uh, graft. Uh, however, we found, as Nihat uh, and others uh, found, that the, the, the graft tear subgroup did not significantly differ from the overall group uh, with regard to the, the constant score, the simple shoulder tear, so the subjective shoulder value. However, they did differ with regard to the external rotation strength and with an increase of uh, fatty degeneration of infraspernatus and teres minor. So we think that this is a combined procedure and you should always do a procedure on the main pain generator in irreparable rotator cuff tear, which is the long head of the biceps, which is to tenotomize or tenodes at least. Up to, to today, we have performed 62 procedures uh, in uh, patients with posterior superior irreparable rotator cuff tears. And uh, the typical patient in whom we, we advise to use the SCR are patients who don't have a glenohumeral osteoarthritis, so a mother one or two grade. And uh, these patients typically have a severely retracted supraspinatus tendon to the glenoid level, an irreparable infraspinatus, or at least partially irreparable. But always these patients should have a reparable a subscapular tendon, or at least uh, intact, or at least reparable. In our series, only one of the patients in the early uh, uh, cases uh, had an irreparable subscapular tendon, uh, and the result was, as uh, the, the clinical study by Mihat this year showed, uh, the, the patient is satisfied, the patient doesn't have pain, so the SCR does provide some pain relief, but it, it, the outcome is un, unsatisfactory. So you shouldn't perform this procedure if the subscapularis is irreparable. But if it is reparable, you get very good results. And you will see in a video uh, shortly after of this same patient with this subscapularis tear. Um, and these patients typically have a severe muscle atrophy of the supraspinatus, which you can classify through the tangent sign, which should be positive. In this case, it's borderline because you see a bit of muscle, a healthy muscle, uh, above the tangent line in the wide scapular view of the T1 acquisition of the MRI. Usually, you should have no healthy muscle above this line. This means that the atrophy is very severe and high probability this would not be repairable and it's a, a preoperative irreparability um, a criteria. And these patients usually have severe fatty degeneration of the supraspinatus or moderate, so grade three to four, and severe or moderate uh, fatty degeneration of the intraspinatus with the spared fatty degeneration of the teres minor or the subscapularis. So as I was saying, in that patient with an irreparable uh, subscapular, uh, with a reparable subscapularis tear, you see in this patient, you start uh, with the posterior portal, and in most patients, you have either an absent uh, along that of the biceps or a severely uh, torn, like in this case, you only have a proximal uh, stump of the long head of the biceps, which we are tenotomizing. It's just a remnant inside the joint with co which causes pain. And then you can check the subscapularis. And in this case, you see it's reducible. And so you repair the subscapularis. And this little arrow here is because as we all know, after we repair the subscapularis tendon, sometimes, the, or most of the times, 
the supra and the infraspinatus can be reduced to their original footprint. But most of the times, in these cases with severe fatty degeneration of the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus, this tendon has a very poor quality. So you can fix it to the footprint, but it won't work, it won't heal. And this is the lower bound for the SCR. Should we do an SCR here? Uh, and repair the remnants of the super and the infraspinatus, which are reduced to the reducible to the footprint after you repair the subscapularis, or should you fix simply or simply do the rotator cuff tear repair? This is the question for me that remains to be completely answered by clinical studies. So uh, if you decide to do the SCR, you then have to uh, perform the SCR after you repair the subscapularis and you see from the posterior portal, you're using the double pulling knot to slide the, the fascial atograft control to the superior glenoid limb. And then you tie, you tie the knot from the glenoid. And then you have limbs from the medial humeral uh, anchor that you can use to repair the rotator cuff remnants if you choose to, to do the SCR and the rotator cuff repair over it. Uh, and this is what you'll see from the lateral portal view. If you use the, the posterior an uh, humeral anchor suture limbs to repair the remnants of the infraspinatus. So what we, we, we advise is that if this infraspinatus uh, is not able to be reduced to its footprint, you should perform simple stitches from the infraspinatus to the posterior margin of the fascial autograft and thrust. If it's reducible, you can load these sutures that you pass, you have passed through the graft, now through the infraspinatus, on the lateral row of the toe configuration fixation of the SCR. So in conclusion, what does the literature show us? It shows that there are short to midterm very good clinical outcomes for arthroscopic SCR in general from one to five years, but using SCR, using a fascial autograph, you know that the MRI graph tear rate ranges from four to 41%, because in all studies with fascial autograph, you have consistently studied with MRI postoperatively all the patients uh, compared to all other studies using other uh, types of graphs, which either have a shorter follow-up or did not consistently assess the, 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 the patients with an MRI postoperatively. Then you have good short-term, one-year promising results. You, for SCR, using a fascial autograft, autograft uh, concomitantly with the rotator cuff tear repair, but this is only the study by Professor Mihata, which showed there is no repair from the rotator cuff, which is promising if you compare with the same type of rotator cuff tears with some criteria of irreparability for just the rotator cuff tear repair without the SCR. And then you have midterm two to 11 year better clinical outcomes if you perform the SCR in patients with either an intact subscapular tendon or an irreparable subscapular tendon tear. And what do we do here? Well, our algorithm for tears of the supraspinatus with an infraspinatus or not tear and uh, uh, with a subscapularis tear that is reparable, uh, we propose arthroscopic surgery to patients who don't have glenoromal arthritis, which have a severely retracted supraspinatus tendon tear, who have severe atrophy of the supraspinatus, so with a positive zanetti tangent sign, and who have moderate to severe fatty degeneration of the supraspinatus. These patients undergo arthroscopic surgery knowing that they might end up either with a rotator cuff tear repair or with an SCR with a rotator cuff repair or with an SCR. So we do uh, uh, the repair of the rotator cuff if the posterior superior rotator cuff is reducible without tension after releases in this type of patients. Uh, after we do a tenotomy or a tenodesis and we check the subscapularis, if it has to be repaired, it is repaired concomitantly. If the posterior superior rotator cuff tear is reducible, but only with tension, then we do the tenotomy, we check for the, S, uh, the subscapularis to repair it, and we do the SCR, concomitantly with the rotator cuff repair over the fascia lata autograft. 
If the patient has an irreducible rotator posterior posterior superior rotator cuff tear, and the, the subscapularis tear is reducible, we do the tenotomy and we do the SCR and we repair the subscapularis. However, we only repair this patient if it's a primary tear. If it's a recurrent tear of a patient who has undergone a previous procedure to repair rotator cuff, we do the SCR uh, uh, in those patients. So I hope that you were clarified about our options. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Clara, for your uh, presentation. And let's move on uh, 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 with Anna's Katarina, with Anna Katarina's uh, uh, presentation. We are going to go with the question, questions after both presentations. So to have a discussion to both uh, uh, with, uh, with both of the, of the presentations. Okay. Can I share my screen? Yes, please. Okay. So, I would like to start by thanking, uh, of course, Manos and Manos for this invitation. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk about SCR. I love it. And uh, I love the opportunity to uh, develop a little bit of my thoughts uh, about this fantastic technique. So, uh, my theme is what is the upper bound? How far can we go with SCR? And we've been, we've been talking a lot about SCR in the past couple of years, and there's a lot of questions that come up repetitively. And I would like to guide my presentation to these questions uh, so that it uh, gives us an, a very important message, message uh, directed to the kind of people that are interested in this technique. So the first one is, I don't do SCR because I cannot understand the rationale. The second one that's all, also very, very frequent is, can SCR reverse pseudoparalysis? The next one, can SCR reverse true pseudoparalysis? And the last one, the topic of this uh, presentation, how far can I go with SCR? So let's talk about uh, the rationale behind SCR. So for, in order to get a glenohumeral and a shoulder girdle effective motion, we need to have two important factors. One of them is that you have to have the, the, the head of the humerus have to be centered in the glenoid during the range of motion. The other one is that you, you need to have a very, very good uh, scapular humeral rhythm in order to obtain all the range of motion. For the head of the humerus to be, set, to be centered uh, in the glenoid through the range of motion, you need vertical stability and you need horizontal stability. These are the well-known force couples. And as Alfred Levy says, may the force couples be with you. So maintaining the center of rotation is our aim in any anatomical technique. And I like to think about the glenohumeral joint as a box. We have to keep the head of the humerus inside the box in order to have uh, an effective range of motion. And we'll, we'll see now how, we, how do we get to close this box with the head of the humerus inside. So in, the, uh, in a healthy joint with a posterior superior cuff intact, you have uh, an intact vertical uh, stability. Uh, when the deltoid pulls the arm up, the posterior superior cuff and the capsule pushes the head of the humerus down, keeping the center of rotation. So you have this effective motion. This is a good abduction. When you do not have a posterior superior cuff and your deltoid push it, uh, pulls the arm up, the center of the humerus loses its center of rotation and it goes up. And then you have an ineffective motion. So you have the well-known anterior superior escape. Why does this happen? This happens because the glenohumeral joint, in order to initiate the, the movement, it works as a fulcrum system, as a pivot system. So you have a force that needs a fulcrum to overcome a resistance, and this resistance is the weight of the, of the arm. So the force here is a deltoid 
the fulcrum is the capsule and the posterior superior cuff. When you don't have a posterior superior cuff or a capsule, the force is tilted. You have the same force, it's still the deltoid, but, but the fulcrum, it's the acromion because the, the head of the humerus goes up. And the problem is that the fulcrum is too close to the origin of the first. So you need a lot more force to overcome the same resistance. And it means if you have the same force, the resistance becomes much higher. This is simple physics. This is one of uh, the reasons why also reverse has so, so uh, such a good result because you have the same force, the deltoid, and you have the fulcrum. That's the interface between the insert and the glenosphere. So here you have the, 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 the contrary. You have the fulcrum uh, far away from the force. So in theory, of course, there's a lot of things to talk about about the, bio, about the biomechanics of the reverse. This is not the only one. But in theory, the, the, the weight of the arm is lesser with this, uh, with this more distant fulcrum. So in SCR, what happens is that we have the same force, the deltoid, and the graft is the fulcrum. So this is an anatomic restoration of the fulcrum. So you have this, you restore the fulcrum to initiate the motion. But you have to understand that this fulcrum, it's very important just at the beginning of the motion. So after a few degrees of uh, active uh, abduction in the scapular plane or forward elevation, the graft loses the fulcrum fo function. So in this case, it restores the vertical balance, but not the horizontal balance. And in this part of the range of motion, it's very important to have the forces that pull the head of the humerus against the glenoid and keep the head of the humerus anteroposteriorly centered in the, in the glenoid. So it's very, very important to also have, so, so that the SCR can work, as Clara said, to have subscap integrity or repairability and to also have a postural inferior cuff integrity or repairability. And that's probably why it's, uh, uh, more, it's very important to repair on top of the of your graph when you do SCR on top any remaining infraspinatus or even teres, teres minor. So again, we have to think about the box. So we're closing the upper part of the box with our graft, but we have to have the anterior and the posterior part of the box intact in order for in order to the glenohumeral uh, joint to move. Also, the other thing that is very important, you have to maximize the scapulohumeral rhythm because as you've seen, the uh, SCR will not restore full range of motion. This will help mostly at the beginning of the range of motion. And in the last degrees, if you want to optimize your range of motion, you need to get a good scapulohumeral rhythm balance. So this leads us to our next uh, question. Can SCR reverse to the paralysis? So when we ask this, I think the real question is, how do you define pseudoparalysis? Because is it, is it a clinical thing? Is it radiological? Maybe both. In the literature, there are a lot of definitions that came up here with a few. This is the more classical one. Active forward elevation, less than 90 degrees with full passive range of motion. Uh, the patient has 90 degrees of active elevation of, of, of the shoulder or less. Here, uh, um, the authors came with the term true pseudoparalysis to distinguish from the originally described pseudoparalysis as no anterior forward elevation with anterior superior scape of the humeral head at any attempt in moving the shoulder. This is the definition by Professor Mihate. Uh, pseudoparalysis, he, he divides it between moderate and severe according to the positivity of the drop arm sign. And he defines it that no shoulder stiffness, full passive range of motion, less than 90 degrees of active elevation. Uh, and in the moderate cases, he had a they had a negative drop arm sign. In the severe cases, they have a positive drop arm sign. Also, uh, no more than a shoulder shrug with minimal glenohumeral motion, and perhaps no more than 45 degrees of elevation due to scapulothoracic motion. This is another definition. Definition by Burks and Tatian, pseudoparalysis should include elevation up to 45 degrees in association with a chronic 
a traumatic massive uteric tear with at least two, three fatty uh, infiltration of the muscle. So here you have passive uh, range of motion, um, active range of motion, chronicity, uh, traumatic nature, the size of the tear, and the fat infiltrations involving the definition of pseudoporality. This is a lot. You can have this definition also by uh, Dr. Burkhardt, active forward elevation less than 45 degrees with full passive forward elevation, um, no change in active or passive forward elevation after injection of seven milliliters of 1% plain xylocaine in the glenohumeral joint. So here you have another factor that's, that's a therapeutic, the therapeutic uh, um, proof factor. So the paralysis, even in this last, uh, in this last definition, they even included an arthritic situation in pseudoporalis. So you have active range of motion, passive range of motion, clinical sign, uh, chronicity, traumatic nature, uh, size of the tear, fatty infiltration, and even a therapeutic test. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, definition for pseudoporalis. And yes, we need to have a better definition for, pseudo for pseudoporalis, but there is, no, is still no consensus and no uh, universal definition uh, of pseudoporalis. So this paper came up like two or three days ago in uh, American Journal of Sports Medicine. It came up ex especially for this talk uh, from uh, Professor Christian Gerber's um, team. Uh, and, they, and they say in the, the title that chronic pseudoporalis needs to be distinguished from pseudoporesis. Now we have a new term that's pseudoporesis. In this study, they evaluated a group of patients with chronic atraumatic massive tear and with preserved passive range of motion. And then this, they distinguished two groups of patients, A and B. The A group, uh, they considered pseudoporetic patients. They did um, abduction in the scapular plane between 45 and 90 degrees. In the group B, they considered to be pseudoparalytic patients that did abduction in a scapular plane less than 45 degrees. The main difference between the two groups was that um, the pseudoparalytic group had more than 50% of the subscapular torn and the subscap was fatty infiltrated at least the, to uh, the stage three of the Gutelier classification. So again, I'll show you the box. There's, we have to think uh, three-dimensionally and not just think about the superior or posterior superior cuff. So can SCR reverse pseudoparalysis? Professor Mihata says it can. Dr. Burkhardt in the United States says it can also. These are both studies from different parts of the world with different teams, with even different graphs. Uh, they studied uh, massive uh, irreparable uteric cuff tears with the mother stages one to three and more than grade three of Gutelier. Also, in both of the studies, all the patients had a repairable or intact subscapularis tendon. So in my point of view, we have two types of patients. Uh, we have a patient, when we have a posterior superior irreparable uteric cuff tear, we have a patient that at rest has a centered glenohumeral joint with the weight of the arm it has a centered glenohumeral joint. So it still has a redundant capsule. And we have the second type of patient that at rest with the weight, with the weight of the arm, he has already a posterior translation and a loss of, um, of the center of rotation of the humeral head. So the problem is that clinically, when these patients initiate the motion, they both produce the same kind of uh, of shrug sign. So this is an anterior superior escape, how we distinguish them. One of them is dynamic, one of them is static. How do we distinguish them, distinguish, distinguish them clinically? The first type of patient has a preserved passive range of motion. The second time usually has a very li limited passive range of motion. Also, when you ask for a standing X-ray and it's very important to explain your technician that we will do a standing x-ray with the arm at the side of the body so that the weight of the arm can reduce the center of rotation of the glenohumeral joint if it is still reducible, if we don't have this fixed lost center of rotation. So 
In the first kind of patient, you can obtain an X-ray like this. In the second kind of patient, you can obtain an X-ray like this. So, but it's, this is very important uh, to have the X-ray, not just the MRI, because remember that the MRI, the patient, the patient is laying down. So you always have a, uh, an image uh, uh, like this with the head of the humerus up uh, uh, next to the acromion. So in the first type of patients, uh, you, it will be easy to put the graft in, and this will probably work because you maintain the center of rotation. You maintain the, the, the head of the humerus inside the box. In the second type of patient, you can try and you can squeeze the, the graft in. You can mechanically put it there, but probably you won't have uh, a good restoration of the range of motion or even the strength but this patient has clodocelt um, usually improve in pain. This is like an interposition atroplasty. So you really have to know what to expect from your patient or what the patient expects from you and from the surgery. So can SCR revert pseudoparalysis? I've been using this image a lot. Uh, this is not a good sign. Yes and no. It depends on the definition. If you have if you can reestablish your center of rotation, yes. If you have a patient with a preserved passive range of motion, also yes. And you have to uh, understand if you have an intact or repairable subscap and posterior inferior cup. So you have to be able to close all the box. You cannot just close it from the top and expect it to work. You have to close it from uh, the front and from the back. So how far can I go with SCR now? I will show you, of course, the Amada classification. Everybody has been waiting for, uh, uh, for the Amada classification in this topic. Uh, and this, is, this can be put very simple. In stage one and two, you can obtain a good SCR with good uh, range of motion, with good strength, and you understood why, because you can really lower the, the, the head of the humerus and maintain the center of rotation and really aid uh, the deltoid in its function. Stage three, it's uh, it's very it's very arguable. You can you have to think uh, with your patient. You have to think about your patient. What kind of patient do you have? Do you want to have to treat? Do you want to treat the pain? The, your patient doesn't want a reverse. You have to really talk to him and try to explain that probably you won't get any uh, fantastic range of motion or uh, any strength recovery but uh, you can alleviate pain and you won't burn bridges for the, the reverse. Um, and in the last three, definitely not. If you do not have a good glenohumeral cartilage, uh, this will probably won't even um, treat the pain and will not restore the, the remaining factors. So this will probably will be a failed procedure. But we need to look not only from the front, a mother classification doesn't give us all the information. So I must say again, always check the subscap, always think about the, the box. Can you close the box? Can you not close the box? If you cannot close the box from the, from the front and from the back, there's no use in closing it on the top. It won't work. So for irreparable posture superior cup tear, SCR is a good procedure if you have a preserved or reversible center of rotation and a preserved passive range of motion. That means that you can put your head inside of the box. You have an intact or repairable subscap, and this also goes for the posterior inferior rotator cuff. And of course, if you have a preserved glenar humeral cartilage, uh, because otherwise you will always have pain and restricted range of motion. But usually if you have a preserved a passive range of motion, you have a preserved glenohumeral cartilage. So thank you so much. I hope that this was useful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna Katarina, for your uh, my presentation. It was very interesting. And uh, before proceeding to the discussion, I would like to see the, the results of the previous poll. So which is your preferred graft uh, choice for SCR? The participants uh, answered that 54% uh, prefer fascia lata. 
8% human dermal allograft, 31% dermal allograft, and 7% other. And uh, before proceeding to the discussion, which, be, which will be very interesting, I would like to ask a second poll question. Which is your preferred treatment of choice for a posterior superior irreparable rotator cuff tear, acute on chronic in a 60-year-old active male with pseudo paralysis and external rotation lag? And the, the options is SCR, lower trapezius transfer, latissimus dorsi transfer, reverse shoulder arthroplasty with uh, latissimus dorsi transfer, or a lateralized reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And also, if you prefer another option. So please take your time and, uh, and uh, uh, answer this question. So I would like also to thank both uh, the speakers because um, they presented so logical um, the uh, ACR and uh, also what are um, what we can succeed with ACR and what are the limits of ACR, what are the clinical results, and what is the biomechanical principles that explain how SCR um, uh, works, uh, functions. And it, it's really very, very uh, interesting. It's really very nice to talk with people, to hear people's, people um, that surgeons that have uh, such um, uh, a defined, such well-defined ideas about uh, what to do and when to do it. Okay. Thank you, Clara. Thank you, Anna. It was really, you, really, really uh, mm -hmm. very interesting. Thank you, Mana. So, um, are there any questions, Manos? C can we comment on the, the, the this last question or we're not supposed to? Yes, of course, yes. we can comment on this, but uh, let the participants answer first. And okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. A bit later. So, uh, one question is, uh, uh, if you have an age limit for deciding, uh, for deciding and doing SCR with fascia lata. Can I... Well... Clara, can you answer this? The question here is not the age. Uh, we know that statistically older people will have poor tendon quality and uh, will have probably more degenerative lesions to the articular cartilage, but we have to, to see it case by case because uh, uh, personally I have repaired um, uh, rotator cuff tendons in 80 year old patients, very active with very good quality rotator cuff uh, uh, quality of the muscle and of the tendon. So I don't think that question is very um, useful to, to, to try to put people in boxes of ages is uh, a prejudice. We should look at the characteristics of the cartilage, the characteristics of the muscle of the tendon and decide according to this criteria of irreparability, repairability, uh, level of destruction of the joint to, to, to determine the, the most uh, adequate treatment option. So you can repair rotator cuff, you can do an SCR and you can do a reverse. It depends on the patient characteristics, not on the number, the chronological age. This is uh, very important that biological age and chronological uh, age and psychological age also are not the same and, yeah. uh, and following only chronological uh, age then you may make a lot of mistakes in 
understanding the patient that you have to treat. And it's very yeah, important for, in, for instance, this, if the patient doesn't understand the rehabilitation, you cannot offer uh, an SCR for an 80 year old patient who doesn't uh, hear well and doesn't understand instructions and cannot do the rehab, which is very, very demanding for an SCR or for a tendon transfer. And then you may opt for a, a reverse, which has a, a less uh, demanding rehabilitation protocol uh, that will we'll end up with a better outcome on this patient because of this, not because of the age, because of these characteristics, as Manos said, just said. Each patient has a psychological uh, environment which is different. I'm sorry. Can I, can I just say something? Just a little bit, Clara, thank you. <laughs> yes, of course. So, yeah. Uh, there's no... There's, uh, not, not much to be said, uh, adding to Clara's comment, but I think that trying to simplify this for our, uh, our participants, when you uh, evaluate this kind of patients, you have to consider three main things. One thing, it's the exam, uh, the, the radiological exams that you have. What, what are the indications according to that exam? The other thing, it's what is your patient demands uh, what does he or she hopes to accomplish with this technique? Strength, pain, range of motion, what, are, what is their level of activity? And the other one, and I think that's the, mo the most important one, and I hope that I pass this message with my presentation, it's how they can um, accommodate the, um, the rehabilitation, the timing and the real restorement of the scapular humeral rhythm because it's very, very important that they can, uh, to optimize the, the result, they can restore uh, uh, or to maximize their scapular humeral rhythm. And most of the older patients, they usually cannot, or even if they're fatter, the fatter patients usually have a, a, some difficulty. Uh, this is completely subjective. This is my experience, not, it's not uh, scientifically proven, but I, as, as I can experience in my outpatient clinic, the fatter patients and the older patients, they usually have more difficult in uh, uh, collaborating with the physical therapists and uh, regaining this uh, perfect uh, scapular humeral rhythm. Um, so this is, this is the way I do it. This is the way I see it in, uh, in, in my point of view. So I think it really becomes easier if you just compartmentalize your uh, your decision in, in these three factors. Anna, can you please describe your rehabilitation program? With, yes. With... yes, the rehabilitation program in uh, SCR is really uh, very similar to the rotator cuff rehabilitation program that we do. We do, we, we, our patients, uh, we leave our patients in a sling for three weeks and then they start in, in when they are in the sling, they, they they do elbow uh, active assisted um, exercises. Then they take the sling off and they do, we, we teach them, they do uh, active forward elevation, actively assisted and passive uh, exercises. And at six weeks, they start with the rehabilitation and the exercise, the, the limitation is the, the exercises that you strength. They cannot do strength against, against resistance for six months, but they start at six weeks, they start uh, regaining the scapular humeral rhythm. And we also, we focus really, when we teach our patients how to do the exercises at home, even without the physical therapist, we teach them to do it in front of a mirror. So they don't, they don't use the scapula, they, they use the glenohumeral joint. So they, they, they can lower their shoulder when they're going up with their arm. That's really um, easy to teach to your patients. It's easy to exemplify and quick in the outpatient clinic. And you, they usually uh, can, uh, can uh, reproduce this kind of exercises. Okay. okay. Um, so let's, Clara, um, here in your talk, I was trying to find the um, the indications for an SCR. And I was thinking, uh, I don't know 
um, I would like to comment on this uh, that I'm saying now. I was thinking the question is when you are going to repair the car, even partially, or when you are going to do uh, a, a repair and SCR or just an SCR. And what is the function of the rotator cuff? Is to stabilize the, to center the humeral hand uh, opposite to the glenoid. And uh, so if we have an instability in the vertical plane, that means that um, uh, the humeral uh, head escapes uh, uh, superiorly, then I could restore the cuff, the anterior and the posterior, if it's restorable or it, or it is intact. And um, then I have two options. Try to, uh, to base the vertical stability on the ability of the anterior and posterior part of the cuff to center the humor head, or also to include ACR, uh, a graph there, that will make easier for the cuff to, uh, uh, to stabilize the humor head. So the main uh, indication for ACR is when I can restore the anterior and posterior part of the cuff, uh, then I can uh, make easier for the shoulder to function if we have a graft in the superior part between the acromion and the humeral head. And um, this gives good results in pseudoparalysis. We cannot restore external rotation with superior capsular, uh, superior capsular construction. If we don't have um, an infraspinatus or uh, teres minor, at least, then SCR will not restore the function of the shoulder. Maybe he will be able to raise the arm and we see many patients that after the operation still can raise the arm, but they do something like this. They don't have external rotation. And this is not an indication for ACR. Is it right? And can you comment on this? Yes, I think uh, um, we're one step behind of the evolution that the reverse shoulder arthroplasty uh, followed because that that's why I, um, I would have to comment on the poll because this is the, the question you you when you have the the deficit of external rotation as you described what do you offer to your patient when you propose a reverse you don't propose the reverse an isolated reverse yeah. Right, you uh, propose a reverse and a transfer. And yeah. if you look at this uh, fresh paper from Mihata, it, and you you read the suggestions from Mihata, you see that that's the step ahead. It's SCR with transfers. Uh, so the the there is no ultimate solution alone, and that 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 the the message I was trying to convey. And like Anna Katerina also did, is that we're trying to close a box, really. We're trying to repair everything we can to restore the center of rotation. And if SCR cannot do it, we have to complement it. We have to repair the subscapularies. You have to repair what you have behind. You have to treat the pain generator. So the main message is SCR doesn't work for everything. It's it's one procedure that you have to combine with others according to the lesions that you have in your patient. And that, that I think is the main message. You don't have one SCR, you have many procedures that you have to do. And that's the evolution of shoulder surgery in every field in instability, is, it's the same. In, in, in rotator cuff uh, pathology, it's like this, you have many uh, you have to try to reproduce as much as possible the, the most favorable anatomy so that the patient yeah. can restore function. That's, that I think is the, the center of the, the, the problem. We would say that when we talk about uh, rotator cuff pathology, we talk about a situation that um, uh, make the shoulder unable to function. And there are two problems there. The first problem is a problem of muscle, of motor, and the second is a problem of tendon. And we have to, if we deal with a problem of tendon mainly, 
then we can do a tendon repair or an SCR. Uh, we can do something like this. If we have a motor problem, a major motor problem, then we have to combine this uh, with a transfer in order to get the motor that we are missing. Yes, I agree. Uh, Manus, uh, are there any questions, other questions? Uh, you, Clara, uh, we have some questions from the participants, but uh, first I want to ask something. Uh, you said, you you show that there is a, an inequality between the clinical results and the, and the uh, healing, and the results of healing. So, uh, do you do and uh, do you make an MRI uh, in your cases after surgery? And if you do, how many months uh, after post-operatively do you do this MRI? And uh, do you do you see? And what is your percent of uh, healing? Well, we 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 in our protocol we don't do an MRI before six months unless there is a significant trauma like patients who, who fall uh, during the six months post-operative period and are really painful and you want to check that, that the surgery didn't get compromised. Otherwise, all patients only, the first MRI is at six months because we want to avoid misinterpreting the MRI with the artifacts of the inflammatory phase of the healing of the rotator cuff remnants, of the healing of the, the fascia lata, which uh, when we started doing this procedure was very poorly understood, the interpretation of the healing of the fascia lata. We didn't have um, a standardized analysis to, to analyze this. So at six months, we do the first MRI and usually do, we do one at, at, at 12 months and then at two years and at three years. And uh, we now have patients with five years uh, we've, we have seen, as uh, I, I told you, and we've published this, um, we have seen an increase in uh, graft tears. Uh, we, 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 at six months, we had a high percentage of what we think is uh, graft healing, and we, had, we, we think it was 9% uh, of uh, graft tearing. And so it, it's difficult, uh, as you can understand, to distinguish between healing or tearing, we don't know. Maybe it did not heal, that's right. I don't know if that's what you, you meant. At six months, maybe it wasn't, it never, it never healed or it tore. So we cannot make that distinction, but we had a 9% uh, graft tear rate at six months. At, at three years, we have a 21% graft tear rate. Uh, so the proportion increases. We are still trying to understand why the graft tears um, because we didn't find any significant differences be preoperatively between patients that had the graft torn and the ones that did not. So there, there doesn't seem to be a predisposing factor among, among the, our series. But also, uh, as we highlighted, we, we have shorter series. And even, even in the, the larger series by Mihata, there is some difficulty in making these assumptions regarding the healing and the prognosis factors because for instance regarding the subscapulary tendon in their series they only they only have i think seven irreparable subscapulary tendons so it's a very short number a, a short sample to compare with the other numbers of patients to say that this is a, a, a predictive factor for tearing of the graft Clara, uh, this is not a, a pure characteristic of uh, superior uh, calf fluid construction. A every, every repair of massive uh, calf tear have the same, uh, the same notice, the same uh, problem. There is an inequality between the healing rates and the clinical results. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you believe, and this, this question is for the three of you, uh, which, which, one, which, which, detail, which is the detail that you believe that there is uh, produce this, uh, this difference between the clinical results and the uh, radiological failure, let's say. Clara, can I ask you something? 
is there there was a, is there any difference in the clinical result between the patients that the graft failed and those that they have an intact graft in the clinical result, not in the radiological result? Is this question for me? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Ah, yes. Uh, the, in the clinical results, there is um, regarding the functional scores, there is no significant difference. There is regarding strength. One, one of the, the, the things that we analyzed when we did the systematic reviews is the type of assessment that is made of patients. When you talk about clinical differences, you have to be very careful when you say there is no difference among patients with, with torn grafts and intact grafts. Because if you're talking about subjective uh, assessment, maybe some patients won't have differences. But if you look at the series with longer follow-up, you'll see that there is a difference in the subjective shoulder value. Patients with torn grafts have progressively decreasing subjective shoulder values with time. In our series, at three years, there was no difference, but there is a tendency to decrease. The, there is a difference with regard to external rotation strength, so they do lose strength, and it, so the studies that don't assess the strength, the ones that are done by phone survey or use the AZ score uh, by phone uh, survey, and they don't measure the strengths, they don't detect so much difference. And I think that's why when you look at the systematic review that I showed you from the CASTA journal, uh, there's such a big difference between SCR and the other treatments. It's because it's the constant score, and the constant score uses the abduction strength. And the abduction strength, yeah, no, not only, it's one of the factors. And in the other scores, no, you don't have the, the, the strength is not assessed. And it's one of the things that is different among uh, patients, of, among different treatment modalities. And that's why you have the lowest constant scores on the tenotomy and tenodesis group and the physical therapy group versus the SCR or the deltoid flap or the graft, uh, the, the rotator cuff advancements, because these procedures, they provide strength. But also we have to be honest when you look at results. You have to know that uh, uh, you have SCR with fascial lata with a longer follow-up, and then you have the other types of SCR with shorter follow-ups. And you cannot compare procedures with, which have so, such a short follow-up with other procedures which have 10 years, 20 years. You, you have had uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty for a much longer periods of time, so you have a longer follow-up for this result. So it's unfair to compare these treatment options, but we are very enthusiastic because we see the patients improving. And the reason why we tried this procedure worldwide was because we weren't satisfied with the clinical outcomes. There was a problem. So that's what we're trying to, to offer to our patients, and not a, a solution that offers a better outcome. If it's SCR, we still don't know. We're st still trying to, to interpret the results. We need more follow-up, but uh, we, shouldn't, uh, we should keep an open mind. And we should, oh, I think it's really important, do not isolate SCR. You're not isolating reverse. You're doing other procedures with reverse. You're doing other procedures with rotator cuff tear repairs. You're doing other procedures with transfers. So don't put SCR just in a, a, a small box, it's only SCR. If it doesn't work for this, don't do it. No, maybe you should combine it and then you get a better result. And even as you said already, as you showed, SCR is not the same operation. It's SCR with the uh, fascial lata, SCR with the dermalograph, SCR with the biceps, SCR with semi tendinosis. There are so many uh, types of SCR so difficult to compare results. But behind all this is a common concept, I think, that you would have to put a passive uh, element to stabilize the humeral head in the vertical plane, and if possible, to connect it with the active elements, the remaining of the rotator cuff. I think this is the concept behind ACR. The, the common concept is behind uh, all this type of uh, treatment. Yes, we have to remember that SCR only uh, 
puts the top of the box in. He only replaces the fulcrum function of the posterior superior cup. He does not replace this replace the second function of the posterior superior cup. That is the pulley function. When we abduct, then the cup doesn't only push the head down; it also pulls the head towards the glenoid. That the the graft doesn't do. That's why the the repair of the remaining infraspinatus or even the remaining supraspinatus or even the rotator cable, it's very, very important if you want to gain all the range of motion and if you want to maximize your outcome. Anna, uh, what is your opinion for SR with, with <laughs> biceps? I think it's a great idea. Um, I've seen, I have never done it. Just one time we used the biceps after we tenotomized it because uh, our fascia in that patient was uh, really, really bad. And we, the, the biceps was hourglass. So it was like spanned and we sewed it on top of the fascia lata. But in that patient is okay, but we haven't studied it and compared it to another, another patient. But the SCR with, uh, with the biceps purely, I think it's great. I've seen the, um, the biomechanical studies. Uh, they have good results with, uh, but the good results that I've seen and I've read in the literature, uh, they use two bundles of the biceps. So I think that just one, maybe it's insufficient because you only have one spot where the graft is attached to the greater tuberosity and one spot where it's attached to the glenoid. So th this will, will make uh, a greater tension in the attachments. And if that one spot um, loosens, Age? you lose Sorry. your fulcrum function. When you have fascia lata or uh, a V configuration or even a square configuration of the biceps, you have four points of attachment and the indefiniteness. So you have a lesser probability of losing the fulcrum function if one of those uh, spots get loosened. So uh, in order to obtain this uh, square on top of the humeral head, you need to have at least a 10, 12 centimeter of biceps. So either you do uh, a tenotomy, uh, an open tenotomy distal, or you do a, 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 a subpack tenodesis, and some of us do it, uh, but it's, it, we usually do not do this kind of tenodesis. So this would be um, not attractive procedure for us, but I can acknowledge that this is, a, this is a, a very promising technique, yes. And it respects the biomechanical uh, um, theory. So I think that probably will work. Okay. Clara, do you have, uh, have you noticed uh, for your patients if uh, the SCR uh, can prevent the superior escape of the, of the head in the long run after doing the SCR? I, I don't understand how, if I noticed uh, an increase in the acromial interval, that's what you mean? How did I... Uh, there's a, one question for the participants that they, they ask if you have noticed uh, that if SCR can prevent the superior migration at the, long, at the long term. At the long term, well, as I said, uh, our oldest patients have a five year follow up, and, um, but it's a, sh a short number of patients who have a five year follow up to date. And I don't think that's considered long-term. It's considered mid-term. Uh, so I don't have long-term results. So this is one of the tests this procedure still has to, to pass um, because uh, Mihata has 11 years follow-up. Uh, that's considered long-term. And in his, in his uh, series, he continues to see the reduction of the spear migration. So in my cases or in Katerina's cases, we, we don't have a long-term follow-up. In the midterm, it, it's, it's holding up. It, we do, as we showed the, the graft tear proportion is increasing, but 
um, even in patients with graft tears, the, the superior migration uh, is not happening. And one of the theories is that after one year of uh, uh, this procedure with the correct uh, rehabilitation, the patients regain their physiological scapular humeral rhythm. And even the, when after the, the graft tears after three or four years, if they keep up with the, their uh, shoulder girdle and the scapular stabilizers is strong, the superior head migration doesn't, doesn't return. If they stop working on their scapular stabilizers, maybe this will happen again. So they you they'll lose the benefit they got from the superior capsule reconstruction because now they don't have a superior capsule graft there because it's torn. So maybe it's what we're going to see uh, further along the line in patients that that have torn at three years, maybe at six years they will have a superior head migration. But the question is, how old are these patients now? And what are their demands? Maybe they don't have any pain anymore and they don't demand so much on their shoulder even though they have a superior head migration. They are okay and they avoided the uh, uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty. They, they were okay for, me, for a long time. For instance, we have patients who have died since the procedure. So they had a, a quality of life for the remaining years without being subjected to a joint a joint uh, replacing surgery, which is more aggressive and might have had more complications, as you know, reverse has a risk, a higher risk for infection and uh, the elderly patients, they fall a lot, they have periprosthetic fractures, which are very complicated to treat. And so maybe we've given them a, a, an end of life with more quality by giving them the SCR. With, I think these are important factors to, have, to consider. Fine, <laughs> okay. Anna, uh, you told us the different, uh, the different uh, pseudo-paralysis uh, meaning. But how you define so paralysis? You don't say. You don't say us about it. Yes, because I don't really think about that. Really, for me, it's complicating something that it's not complicated. We like to generalize and create terms uh, to make our life easier, but sometimes it makes our life uh, more difficult because you. Why, why do you need a term in something that you can? just uh, define with two or three words for yourself. These are different kind of patients. That we, if, you, if you notice in our papers, we never use that, uh, that term, the seroparalytic patients or not, because I think that that's really a, that's a wrong step uh, to do in science when there's, there's something that it's not defined. When you try to base your study in a concept that it's not universal, you will always get uh, a controversy. And what we aim in, in science is to, get, is to get consensus. So I don't use I don't use pseudo paralysis. I don't define it. For me, uh, it's uh, it's that's the the, the logic that, that I presented. That's the logic I use. It's the reversibility of the center of rotation. It's the passive range of motion. Uh, it's the integrity of the anterior and the posterior inferior um, rotator cuff. That's the real deal. That's the, the things that matter to me, not that the thing is if the patient is pseudoparatic or pseudoparalytic or whatever. I, have to, I look at my patient and I try to understand what's happening inside his, his or his, his shoulder, uh, her shoulder. Um, and, and try to, to correct what's wrong. So I think that's, that's a way to lessen our, um, our mistakes. Yes, it's better to be more precise and try to describe better. Um, for me, uh, the main the problem is the patient who can't raise the arm actively 
above 45 to 50 degrees, it still has uh, good passive range of motion, and uh, uh, he is not having pain, or you stop pain with local anesthetic. Because a lot of patients that are defined as pseudo-paralytics are just patients that they can't raise the arm because of pain. And this is not the same with a, a mechanical uh, inability to raise the arm when you don't have pain. It's a completely different situation. Uh, something also, something is the same that I would like to highlight. It's about arthritis. Because arthritis is a very um, general term meaning mainly the destruction of cartilage. But the clinical situation that we face in patients with arthritis, especially in the first stages of arthritis, are completely different. And there are patients that they have arthritic, arthritic signs, but still they have uh, minimal symptoms. Uh, and if we have a patient that his problem is mainly pain and uh, he has a good passive range of motion and he has not having creptus, then we can do SCR in the upper limits of SCR. Still, we can propose such a treatment and have a good, uh, I think you can expect a good result in this space. Very important because yes. if we base mainly our treatment in MRI and X-rays, then probably we are going to overtreat a lot of patients and increasing the possibility of severe complications. Yeah, and some some people would say now, Manos, that uh, you can treat also treat those patients with uh, an antinotomy or a tenodesis. And usually uh, it's the pain you can treat with that, but if you don't have uh, cartilage damage, but you cannot restore the strength, you cannot restore uh, the you cannot optimize the range of motion. So you have if you have something that it's better, unless your patient chooses for the first option, of course, you have to explain everything to them. But if you have something that it's better, uh, and you can do it arthroscopically also, why not? Yeah. And even let me add, sorry, <laughs> uh, say if I'm talking too much, please uh, shut me up. So. Even uh, SCR has the potential advantage, of course, of um, maybe stopping the progression of the um, rotator cuff arthropathy, at least theoretically, if you diminish the, um, the movement um, of the, um, the center of rotation, the loss of the center of rotation during the range of motion, this will theoretically um, uh, slower down the progression of the rotator cuff arthropathy. So you're theoretically, because we don't have, uh, of course, a long-term result, as Clara said, we're theoretically offering our patient a better joint for a longer time. Fine, fine, perfect. Again, um... Maybe it's uh, time to have the second poll results. I can, I, I would like to ask to have them in the screen. So the results in the second question is... Uh, well, we, we sold our uh, option. Okay, so... But it's too small, the, the, the little <laughs> print. Okay. Give me a minute in order to be able to to read it also. So the the SCR is about half percent. I can I, I can read it. I cannot read it also. Uh Maybe I'll take a picture and amplify it. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, uh, I can uh, see them. SCR has 33%, low trapezius transfer 11%, latissimus dosi transfer 22%, reverse shoulder arthroplasty with latissimus dosi transfer 33% also, 
lateralized reverse shoulder arthroplasty, uh, 5%, other zero. So, uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty with latissimus dorsi transfer has a 33%, superior capsule construction has a 33%, one third of the participants, both. And now, uh, reading again the, um, the question, I would say that if I was going to do a superior capsule reconstruction, I would have to uh, check that uh, the uh, infraspinatus and the teres minor, minor are repairable. Otherwise, I would not do something like this, or I would you could combine superior capsule reconstruction with a transfer. This is something that Philippe Valenti also discussed a lot and uh, yes, why not? Going to this problem. The, yeah, the, the question is what is chronic and what is acute in this lesion? And that, that, that's what you have to analyze when you treat this patient. And another thing is what I like from this poll is that, as I was saying, you have SCR uh, here alone, but then you have the reverse with the transfer. <laughs> because we're we're one step behind of reverse. But so there should uh, but be an we option were, SCR with a transfer, and then it we, were, we were trying to have a battle. But uh, <laughs> it's a great uh, success for you, girls. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great success for you. Uh, you convinced the, the audience that uh, it's an, an equal in equal position. I think it's a great success. You should. No, uh, it's not. It, SCR is better. That's what I'm saying because the <laughs> the reverse there has the, the help of the transfer. Yeah. No, I, I think that first of all, we have to, in that patient, we have to understand if the tear is minor, if we have a, a, a rupture, a tear of the tear is minor and the infraspinatus, and the, if they are reparable. Because before the transfer, we can try and repair it. Of course, if yes. you have a positive yes. ro external rotation leg sign, you can still have a repairable uh, posture inferior rotator cuff, right? So you yes. can do a repair of the posterior inferior rotator cuff and an SCR, and it will be great. Yes, yeah. but it's only, it is only a question, <laughs> Anna, it's only a question. <laughs> you need a, a medical record, you know, the, <laughs> too, many, too many options, too many divisions. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for your presence here. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It was very Thank you for asking. interesting. Yeah, we learned yeah. a lot. Thank you, Clara. Thank you, Anne, Katerina. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you with us. As always, a pleasure. Thank you again for accepting the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And thank you very much, uh, everyone of us, for attending. And uh, help us, please, to improve by completing a tiny questionnaire displayed in, uh, in your screen. And thank you once again for attending. See you next time. Bye. See bye, you. Bye. bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone who wishes uh, for best wishes for for the holiday period and the and the new year. <laughs>